Hello, everybody. Welcome to month 17 of Eureka Whiskey Club. It's crazy to think that we are now um, over a year and a half of this, uh, or close to a year and a half. I can't do math currently, uh, of this uh, wonderful program. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just thank our members uh, for you know, just continuing to be amazing and, and patient with us, dealing with a few supply chain issues these past couple months. I think uh, pretty much every bit, every every uh, line of work has some type of supply chain issue at the moment. We are not uh, spared from that at the moment, uh, you know, in our industry. So thank you to all our members for just your patience. Uh, you know, we have had to push back our pickup dates a couple for this past couple months, but I assure you the, uh, the wait is well worth it. Um, uh, once again, we are joined by two amazing people in the uh, craft spirits industry um, from 1792 Distillery. Um, and without further ado, I will allow uh, Chris and Danny to introduce themselves. Uh, Chris, you want to you want to go first with a quick introduction? Let people know who you are. Sure thing. Yeah, I'm Chris Collins. I'm the marketing manager for Barton 1792 Distillery. Uh, looking after our wonder por wonderful portfolio of whiskey brands. I've been with the company for. A little over two and a half years, but as a Kentucky native, I've been around bourbon all my life. I actually grew up in Frankfort, Kentucky, right down the street from Buffalo Trace Distillery, uh, which is our sister distillery where my office actually is. So it's kind of a, a dream come true and to work in such an industry that I've been passionate about for a long time um, and been very fortunate to work with Danny for the past two and a half years and bringing these brands to life and continuing to push them forward. So I'm very excited to be here with the, with the group tonight. I know there's a lot of you all out there, so thanks for joining and with that, I'll kick it over to Danny. Well, good evening, everybody. Danny Kahn. I am the master distiller of the Barton 1792 Distillery. And although that title may vary in terms of duties from place to place, I actually run the distillery. So I'm responsible for grain into the operation all the way through milling and mashing and fermentation and distillation and putting in the barrel and taking out of the barrel and blending and all that stuff. So... I'm excited to talk to you all. Um, I've been here for three and a half years as the master distiller, but I've been making alcohol for my God, 34 years, about 31 of those professionally. So um, let's hope we have a lot of great questions and this will be fueled on um, your interest level. Otherwise I will just ramble on about things that may or may not be meaningful to you. I told, I told Danny that we can get pretty geeky on our, uh, on our virtual tasting. So, um, I, I think that may be a challenge to our members, to those watching, you know, who, you know, ask some geeky questions for Danny. Um, so just uh, before we get into kind of our discussion here, I just wanted to uh, bring up the fact, you know, we've been doing this for the past few months that uh, we've got some uh, prizes to give away. Uh, we have two swag bags to give away tonight to the uh, people with the, the best two questions of the evening. So feel free or please, you know, comment your questions as we go. Uh, we'll try our best to get, get to as many as possible and we'll reserve kind of the last 20, 30 minutes of the call to Q and a. So in the swag bag, we're going to have, you know, shaker tins, some spoons, um, seeing that, uh, 1792 is a sister distillery at Buffalo trace. It's going to come in a Buffalo trace, uh, backpack, uh, along with a signed bottle of 1792, um, in, in those swag bags. So we have two, two prizes to give away tonight. Uh, for the two best questions, and we'll let Chris pick one, and then we'll let Danny pick one. Um, so no pressure, guys, but uh, you're going to be deciding who gets these uh, amazing swag bags at the end of the night. So uh, really excited and uh, excited to see everyone's questions. Uh, Chris, I, you know, I'd love to pass it to you just um, as the uh, marketing manager for 1792. Uh, would love to learn a little bit more about the distillery, kind of the history. Um, and all things 1792. And I understand you have a kind of a presentation here to share with us tonight, which uh, I think is going to be pretty cool. Absolutely. Yep. I'll pull that up now. All right. So once again, thank you all for joining. I'm not going to spend too long talking about the history of the distillery. I know we're all here to drink and hear from Danny. Um, but what's what's a marketing guy without a good presentation, right? So with that being said, 
a little bit about Barton 1792 Distillery. So today, 1792 is made at Barton 1792, which is located in Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, many of you all know Bardstown is known as the uh, bourbon capital of the world. About 95% of the bourbon comes from uh, Kentucky, and about 35% of that comes out of Nelson County, where Bardstown is. So it's a big center of distillation with a lot of big distilling names. And Barton 1792 is the oldest continually operating distillery in Bardstown. Um, so we have a lot of history there. The number 1792, uh, that's the year that Kentucky became a state. So that's our namesake. We'll get into a little bit more about Barton when we talk about the history. But today, our distillery sits on 196 acres with uh, actually more than 29 barrel aging warehouses. We've built a few since this presentation was last updated. And we have over half a million barrels aging on the property. So we like to think we're on the small side of big but quite a bit of aging whiskey on the property. And with that being said, just to take a step back into history. So as I mentioned before, we're located just outside of downtown Bardstown and we're built in a small valley with access to natural limestone spring water that helps to feed our production. Uh, the distillery was, was founded by Tom Moore in 1889, but before Tom Moore started the Tom Moore distillery, as it was known at that time, he worked with a man named Ben Mattingly um, and they assumed ownership of the Morton Spring Distillery in 1879, 10 years earlier. So that distillery is actually located just across the road um, in the same valley where 1792 sits today. And they were producing under the Mattingly and Moore name. Uh, in 1889, as I mentioned before, Tom Moore decided to go out on his own and open his own distillery named the Tom Moore Distillery. Um, he had a dispute with the ownership at that time um, and decided to go out on his own. So at that point, there, I had 115 acres um, and he distilled on his own until Prohibition in 1920. Uh, with a number of brands, Tom Moore being one of them, the Bell of Nelson being another, um, and he distilled all the way until Prohibition in 1920. And as many of y'all know, and, and during Prohibition, a lot of distilleries received permits to operate and make what was called medicinal whiskey. There was a lot of sick people during Prohibition, believe it or not, that really needed their prescription to get their whiskey. But unfortunately, Tom Moore's distillery was not um, not permitted to produce, so they shut down all during Prohibition. Uh, Post-Prohibition, Tom Moore reopened the distillery with his son Cornelius or Con Moore uh, once Prohibition was repealed. Uh, Con Moore actually experienced some financial troubles and ultimately filed for bankruptcy in 1938. Um, and at that time, now, the distillery was acquired by Oscar Getz. Chris, I have a question. Um, sure. You know, after Prohibition, were they able to reopen in the same, you know, the same facilities using the same equipment like i'd imagine you know things i've read is that during prohibition a lot of distilleries were unable to you know maintain the buildings and the land that they were on and even sometimes the equipment like do you, do you know what what the distillery looked like post prohibition like how hard was it to to reopen um yeah from from my understanding i know that he was able to get reopened relatively quickly after prohibition i think he had to make some investments obviously that's what happened they got into some financial issues uh, but i believe that most of the facility and as you see here today this this red brick building um, was not part of the original tom Moore distillery but to the right of that there is a, a limestone section of this building that's actually original on property to the tom Moore distillery so if you ever come to visit you can see that it still stands today um but as i mentioned before oscar getz was a, a whiskey merchant prior to prohibition he was based in chicago um, and he acquired the distillery along with the business partner. And he became the largest uh, wholesaler of bourbon and whiskey in a seven state region by 1940. And he established Barton Brands in 1940 to buy Tom Moore Distillery. So with that in mind, uh, the name Barton, a lot of people ask where did that name Barton came from? Is it somebody's name? Is it, um, what does it mean? And the legend has it that there was a poker game and the winner was um, said to pick the name out of a hat. So I actually don't really know where the name Barton came from. I like to think that maybe it's a, a shortened version of Bardstown. I think that makes the most sense to me, but it's just a fun piece of history. You don't really know. But um, during the 1940s, there was a devastating fire for the distillery and um, Oscar Getz was able to rebuild that relatively quick, quickly um, and get back in business. So with that being said, Oscar Getz ran the distillery um, up and through the 70s and 80s and eventually sold out to the company we purchased the property from Constellation Brands. Um, so Sazerac acquired Barton 1792 Distillery along with a handful of brands, including 1792 in 2009. But the bourbon itself was uh, originally came out in 2003. So we've, we're going on 20 years of making 1792. 
at Barton 1792 Distillery. And we also produce a, a range of other brands all the way from the value side, very old Barton you may have heard of, all the way up to our extended cask finished whiskey brand, Thomas S. Moore, named after our founding namesake. Um, so purchased by Sazerac in 2009, and we've grown quite a bit since then from 165 employees to 500 plus, over 600,000 barrels, and we're continuing to work to develop new 1792 expressions to get um, those out to consumers. We know that everybody really loves the expressions apart from small batch, which is our bread and butter flagship brand. What's this copper barrel here on the bottom right hand corner here? Danny, you want to speak to the tailbox? Tailbox is um, currently a showpiece and that is the distillate that comes out of our still and then our doubler. So that is where we have a hydrometer. So we're sort of monitor and proof, but we also use some higher tech to measure, but that's a good place for us to sample monitor flow. Um, it used to be very much under lock and key when we were under tighter TTB controls, but that is called the tail box. And that's where, our that where you're making your cut or. I'm um, sorry. Is that what? Where you're making your cut? Like heads. Uh, and jingles is that, so, so we use a column still. So yes, uh, what happens is it comes off the column still, and then we put it through a second still called a doubler, which is similar to a thumper if people have heard of that and that is on the way to our tanks prior to proofing it down before we put it in a barrel cool yeah it looks like we got some really good questions brewing here in the chat danny a lot of questions about uh terroir as it relates to corn growing where you know where we get our corn from etc so that'll be some really good q a later i want to make yep. sure we flag those uh, before we get into the tasting section or we talk about bourbon making with Danny, I do want to spend a second talking about what I mentioned before, 1792 small batch, which is, like I said, it's our flagship bourbon of the 1792 distillery. And this product uh, came out in 2003 originally under the name uh, 1792 Ridgemont Reserve. In 2015, we updated the packaging to make it more modern and more cosmopolitan feeling um, to really help set, you know, set it apart from other bourbons on the shelf in the market. And Danny will talk more about this, but this is a high rye bourbon. It uses corn, rye, and malted barley and has a unique high rye mash bill. We typically only age bourbon on the top floors of our rickhouses. So the bottom floors, we age other things like brandy, but the top floors are reserved for bourbon. While we don't carry an age statement, um, once again, Danny will probably speak more to this. We only remove barrels from the warehouses at peak maturity. And um, as such, we know what bourbon, it takes quite a long time. Typically our, our 1792 bourbons for the most part are seven to eight years old. So we go through, we select barrels for 1792 small batch, marry them together. And that's what results in 1792 small batch bourbon. So I know tonight you all are going to be tasting foolproof, a single barrel select, which Danny will talk more about as well. Um, but that uses the same high rye mash bill as 1792 small batch. And this is typically what you can find um, in your, you know, in your stores at your restaurants each and every day. So with that being said, I'm going to pass this off to Danny to talk about bourbon making and get us through the tasting. All right. So um, as I stated, I am the master distiller. I don't typically do this. This is not my day job. So I am just going to ramble on and hopefully hit on some points that are of interest to you all and um, a little bit of background and then we will taste. Unfortunately, I do not have to taste what you have to taste. So we're not gonna be able to compare notes. I'm not gonna be able to give you my impression. I do, however, have my own uh, foolproof, but it will probably be quite different than what you have as a single barrel. So that being said, um, I went to the University of California Davis as a chemical engineer. And it turns out that I um, acquired a small pot still at a antique shop or pawn shop or something. And that actually became a very useful tool. We would um, dump the bottoms of the empty kegs or the empty cans of beer, and we would distill it. And we would literally distill it seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times. So we were essentially making vodka. And frankly, some of it was better than the vodka that is on the shelves today. I, for one, do not like vodka um, because by TTB definition it is colorless, flavorless and odorless. But anyways, I started making vodka as a hobby. Um, it turns out that where I went to school, there was a brewing science program. And before that, I started making beer as a hobby. And there is an enormous amount of really good science out there on beer. 
So rather than studying my classes, I was in the stacks of the library um, trying to figure out how to make better beer. We, um, we literally brewed about 10 gallons a week, my roommate and I, for two years. And um, um, we did not drink all that beer, but we would typically make 10 gallons, split it into two. So we had experiments and then we often distilled that. So little did I know my hobby was going to turn into a profession. I'm not going to get into that a whole lot unless there's qu questions later, but I, um, I worked at Anheuser-Busch for many, many years, many locations, did international work, was in charge of raw materials for a while, was in charge of our new brand development in the mid-90s when craft beer was becoming big. I did a lot of technical roles, and that's where I really learned the technical side of brewing. And by the way, everything we do in distilling or everything we did in brewing applies to distilling. Um, and we can talk more about that as we go. So that's kind of how I got started. I went to Sierra Nevada Brewing Company as their technical director for about four and a half years. And um, I'm, I'm a fan of bourbon. I'm, I'm fond of saying now to my beer friends, you know, beer is for quitters. Because if you simply distilled it and let it age for a decade, you could turn it into bourbon, sort of. When you distill hopped beverages. What, did, what does Ken Grossman think of that when, you, when he hears that? Um, <laughs> he probably hates it and he probably chuckles, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of, uh, distilling hopped beers, but, uh, but yes, I, um, I say that tongue in cheek. Um, I learned a lot from the beer world and I, um, um, value and use that every day. So it's very, very applicable to what we do today. So let's talk about that. Um, now we don't have a big open exchange, but the one thing that I like to share with everybody is and nobody ever gets this right most a lot of people are close to being right but there are five things required by law to be bourbon and they are precisely it has to be at least 51 percent corn um, it has to be aged in a new charred oak container doesn't have to be a barrel doesn't have to be white oak doesn't have to be american oak it just needs to be a new charred oak container we use barrels because they're easy to roll boxes are hard to move around so we don't put them in both boxes. Um, it's got to be made in the USA. We um, believe that bourbon has to be made in Kentucky, but that's just us. But by law, it has to be made in the USA. And um, it can be put away in a barrel, a container, at no more than 125 proof. And one point that is extremely important and doesn't get enough credit is that it cannot be distilled at more than 160 proof. So that's important because the harder you distill something, vodka, for example, has to be distilled to at least 180 proof. And by doing that, you are really stripping out almost every bit of flavor and aroma that exists. So the harder you put something through the still, the higher the proof, the less congeners you have, and frankly, the less flavor it is. So if I made a distillate at 160 proof, and by the way, I, I assume everybody knows, but um, 100 proof is 50% alcohol. Um, so if I made a distillate at 160 proof and diluted it to 125 before I put it in the barrel versus making that distillate at 135, which was what we do, diluting it down to 125, those two would taste radically different. They would not even begin to seem like the same distillate. So the degree to which we distill something um, speaks to how much flavor we carry over and what the end result will be. So those are the five things required to be bourbon, super important. And um, and again, to get sort of the juices flowing, the questions flowing before we taste, I encourage you all to sip if you have it. But um, I like to speak in terms of the levers that I get to pull to create flavor. So certainly there's the grain bill. Everyone wants to talk about the grain bill. Um, I personally believe it is not top three in terms of the most important flavor that we're creating in the final product. Um, and that, my goodness, that, that also depends on how old it is, how much maturity there is. But the grain bill is certainly a very important part of what we do. And as we go through this, I'll speak a little bit about our bourbon and why it's a little bit unique, I think. We do use a high rye grain bill. I, I, I would actually probably call it a moderate rye, to be honest. But um, before anybody asks, although I don't think it's a big deal, we are directed not to talk about the specifics of our grain bill. So if that question is out there, you can count on it not being answered. But just know that we consider it to be a moderately high 
uh, rye grain bill. Um, I think that lends itself very nice to cocktails. Rye, in my opinion, this is a, um, a, a an opinion, rye lends itself really well to bourbon or whiskey spirit forward cocktails. Rye is spicy and complex, and I think it works really well with a little citrus, a little sweetness, a little bitters. So higher rye bourbons to me are really the perfect complement to a cocktail. Anyways, so we have our grain bill. Um, a lever that I don't hear every, anyone talking about is the cooking process. And when we make bourbon, we will grind all those grains up. We will add it to water. Those grains will hydrate. As we heat them up, they will gelatinize, which is the swelling and bursting of starch. And then enzymes that are in the malted barley will break down that starch into sugar. And that is critically important because yeast cannot eat starch. They have to break that starch into sugar before they can convert it to alcohol. But the thing that's really interesting, I don't know if anybody cooks oatmeal, not in a microwave, but on a stove. And if you ever cook oatmeal, um, I burn my oatmeal probably at least half the time. And when you burn it, you can smell it throughout the entire house. The same thing applies in the cooking operation. If you burn your grain, you are gonna create some flavors. They may not be bad flavors, but they are flavors. And I think that um, I've played with this in my lifetime. If you cook it really hard, you'll get more grainy flavors. If you cook it very gently, you'll get less. So it's a spectrum. Depending on what you're looking for, you can cook it hard, you can cook it soft. But outside of converting starch into sugar, which is the primary objective, you can create flavors. So that's a flavor creating step. Um, the grain bill, of course, matters. And, and by the way, the things I'm talking about and I'm sort of flying through them is because each one of these topics could probably be many, many hours. So I'm just, um, you know, presenting some little tidbits here and there. But <clears throat> rye is a very powerful flavor. And, and there are many, many different rye varieties. Some of them are very pronounced cinnamon. Some can be the ones I prefer tend to be more nutty and a little spicy, a little peppery, a little bit floral. But there are many rye varieties. So just to say one uses rye in their bourbon is not nearly enough to really understand what flavors will be generated. Um, again, I'm not a fan at all of cinnamon forward ryes. I like the nutty ryes. But here's the thing that I also like to explain. We're not tasting any weeded bourbons right now. But here's, here's a little tidbit I think that's really valuable. But when you're going to taste a bourbon that has let's say seven years of age. And by the way, we'll talk about age later. That's a very misleading number, but let's just assume right now, if we're talking about a bourbon that has rye in it, for seven years versus the exact same bourbon, but instead of rye, it has wheat. Um, the presence or the, let me see, the absence of rye is way more important than the presence of wheat. Wheat is a very, very mild flavor. Rye is very robust and flavor forward so that when you don't have rye, if that bourbon is a little bit immature, you're going to taste a little bit of the biscuity of the wheat. But once it gets to be a more mature product in our warehouses, seven years ish, um, you will not taste the wheat, but you will taste all of the maturation components from the oxidation of the fermentation congeners from the um, um, caramel and the vanillas and the lactones and all the different flavors that come from the barrel aging process. So again, really the presence of rye is more important than the absence of wheat. When you don't have rye, you tend to taste more of the aging components. Anyways, I'm jumping ahead. So that's an important little bit of information. To me, probably, I, I believe the most important flavor contributions are what happens in fermentation. So in fermentation, obviously we're creating alcohol and many, many yeasts are out there. Many are very, very different. Even within the same yeast variety, I can change the flavor by fermenting at a different temperature or by providing different nutrients. By manipulating the environment the yeast are in, we can actually change the flavor. And that is one of the things that also makes our um, bourbon, I think, quite unique. We have a very flavorful yeast. It produces a lot of components called esters, which are generally, generally fruity. And we produce a little bit of a banana ester. It smells a little bit like bananas. And it's called amyl acetate. 
And when you mix that component with the barrel aging caramels and vanillas, it almost tastes like bananas foster if the bourbon is aged enough. So that's something that we often get out of our out of our bourbon. But just to sort of put it in perspective, and this is some of the geeky stuff, for every pound of sugar we have in a fermenter, we produce a half a pound of alcohol, approximately, a half a pound of carbon dioxide, a little bit of yeast mass, uh, but we produce many, many hundred different components. They're so small, they're actually really hard to measure. Um, you certainly would not be able to weigh them, but all of those components are what contribute flavor and what really help the bourbon age over time. Those are the components that if you have a properly aged bourbon, you get stone fruits and you get dried concentrated cherries and apricots. And when I speak of stone fruits, that's what I mean. And you get different fruit, fruit flavors. And that's to me, when you have a really, truly special bourbon, it comes from um, it comes from um, the aging of the fermentation characters as one of the most important flavor characteristics. So, um, you know, that process alone we could talk about for probably hours. <clears throat> All right. So um, the still, now we're at the still, right? We've fermented, we've, we've cooked, the, we've milled the grains, we've added water. How long have you guys are for, uh, fermenting for, Danny? Uh, I'm sorry, how long? Yeah, was it two, three uh, it, days? It, 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 there's a little bit of variability depending on what we're making, but the majority of our uh, grain bills are about four days. So it's a pretty fast, pretty, a pretty aggressive fermentation, but it's uh, four days. And then... And one thing that's really interesting, um, you know, a lot of distilleries do not control fermentation temperature. We have heat exchangers on our fermenter so that we uh, try to control that very tightly. But a difference of two or three degrees Fahrenheit makes a um, significant difference in flavor. And is that something that you brought over from your brewing experience just because of how important temperature control is during fermentation and brewing? Or was that something that 1792 or Barton was doing even before you got there? A little bit of both. And that's actually kind of an interesting point, because one thing about the beer world is there's an enormous amount of really good science. And there is less of that in the distilling world. And everything that we do in the beer world, in fact, in the beer world, it, you, you, you create a wort, you boil it, you separate components, and you convert things differently to get different body. There's a lot more stuff going on actually in the beer world up until that point of fermentation. But one thing, my job was not to change the flavor of um, 1792, but we had some inconsistencies and sometimes it was really good and sometimes it was not as good. And it became a process to really understand which one of those, you know, in that spectrum of flavors, where do we want to be? So we identified it and are making it more consistent than we ever have. And do you think um, that the, the lack of science or, the, you know, I don't want to say lack of science, but I say less science in the distilling world is due to the fact that you're able to hide imperfections more after the distilling process versus in, in brewing, where if you have bad temperature control during fermentation, you can be producing a lot of off flavors. No, I don't think that's it. I think that um, while beer is um, it's a faster process, it lends itself to more data. And um, I think the process can, can be controlled more. You know, I can control the creation of the distillate, and there's a lot of good science on that. But once it goes in the barrel, it's kind of tricky because there are differences in what part of the tree it came from, what part of the forest, how the barrel was seasoned, how it was toasted, if it was toasted, and then, of course, how it was charred. So there's a lot of variability and even barrel to barrel variations. You guys have a single barrel. That's one of the most fun things to do is to pick single barrels because sometimes they are very different than one another. Sometimes they're more similar. So, so there's a lot of variabilities that are variables that are hard to control. But I think that everything that we create in the barrel, um, I think that there are more opportunities for deviations in, in whiskey than there are in beer. You know, I, yeah, that's, that's kind of a hard thing to say, but there are many, many different flavors because that barrel aging process and the long, slow oxidation is really, really important. And a lot of stuff develops over that time. And by the way, that's a very, very important point. So, so well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But the still is interesting. You know, my title is Master Distiller, but the still, um, super important, but it removes water, number one, right? It concentrates the spirit 
And then you really don't create flavors in the still as much as you concentrate and remove certain components. It's very important because it affects flavor, but you're not really creating flavor in the still. You're just separating and purifying. And, and how that's run and how we control temperatures and pressures um, and flow rates does affect flavor. But you're not really creating flavor again as much as you are removing components you don't want. So that's an interesting piece. Now, when you get into the barrel aging, and my God, we could talk about this for days, but there is, you know, of course, the char. 100% of the bourbon color comes from uh, the barrel. Um, and it's really impossible to tell you how much of the flavor comes from the barrel. I know I've heard a lot of people say 80 or 90 percent, and I completely disagree with that. I think um, and the reason why I, I say that is, is that I think that you have a lot of character in the whiskey that comes from the corn, which is dominant from the rye, but then also the fermentation. And then what happens is, you know, you lose volume over time. You know, we probably average about 4% loss a year. And then as volume gets lost and, and it, it's replaced with oxygen and that oxygen reacts with all those congeners and creates complexity and really depth of flavor. That's part of it. But then the other part is that in the hot months, the bourbon gets pushed into the wood and the cold months, it gets pushed out of the wood. But the really special bourbons are the ones that have a slow oxidation that creates complexity. And that's one reason why small barrels, you know, some some smaller distillers will use little 15 gallon barrels. And, um, and this becomes a preference, but I believe that uh, what you get out of that is you get very deep color and you get a lot of woody flavor because your surface to volume ratio is so hot. You're getting a lot of stuff from the barrel and you don't get that long age. So it's a, it's a great way to make a bourbon that look looks pretty really fast, but they're very one dimensional. You get oak and you don't get good fermentation, oxidation, maturation. And by the way, that brings up a great point. Um, it's important when you buy bourbon to uh, make sure it says straight on the label. Again, this is my preference. Straight has a very important meaning. It means it's aged at least two years. And if it doesn't say straight, you really have to ask yourself, why doesn't it say straight? So straight needs to have no artificial colors or flavors added. It has to be aged at least two years. And if it's aged, if the bourbon is aged less than three years old, it has to say how old it is. And typically, if you see a bourbon that's not straight, it'll probably say aged at least one year. And if it was aged at least one year and it's really dark, probably it came from a little barrel. So you get a lot of oak, but you don't get the flavors that drive the highest quality to me, which is those fermentation congeners that age over time. So, um, so real quick, and then maybe we'll taste the bourbon, but I believe that um, asking the age of a bourbon is, um, is really not the right question. You know, a lot of people want to ask, how old is that? Well, you know, our bourbon is the, this um, foolproof is probably averaging about seven and a half years. Um, but it's not the age that's important. It's the maturity. So as Chris had said earlier, um, some of our warehouses are a little cool and a little damp, and some of them are a little bit hotter and a little drier. However, all of our warehouses on the first floor are cool, and the bourbon will age very, very, very slowly. We rarely put any bourbon on our first, second, or third floor. We reserve it for four, five, six, and seven. And roughly speaking, just to sort of give it, um, give it a, um, a, a, a sort of a recognizable point, um, if you're talking about a seven-year-old bourbon between the seventh floor and the sixth floor, the lower floor will actually taste approximately a year younger. So it really is a driving force for how that bourbon ages. Um, I've tasted a lot of bourbons that are five or six years old, and they're very, very grainy. They're very, um, 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 you know, uh, grain forward and fruity. And I think that's actually wonderful for bourbons. I think that when bourbons are younger, and there's nothing wrong with a younger bourbon, but when bourbons are younger, you don't get 
the maturation components, the oxidation, the caramel, the vanilla, the coconut, which is a lactone that comes from the barrel, you don't get those. So what you get are the grain bills. You can taste the corn, you can taste the rye, and you can taste a little bit of the fruitiness from the fermentation. So that's actually very good. And actually, it's my preference for some cocktails. But that is the sign of a younger, and again, I, I'm even guilty of it, not a younger bourbon, but a less mature bourbon. I've tasted 12-year-old bourbons that are on our second floor that taste a lot like our five-year-old bourbons that are on our seventh floor. So it's not just age, but it's the maturity. And that's really a function of temperature and humidity. The hotter the temperature, the drier the climate, the faster the bourbon will age. So, so again, age is probably not the best. Uh, it's a very, very important point. But it, it's more than just age. It has more to do with maturity. All right. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions at this point, but uh, shall we taste um, um, yeah, let's, something different? Let's taste. Um, so as always, everyone uh, has their whiskey cards. Um, so these are my tasting notes. Uh, and then just one quick note on the questions, which I forgot to mention at the beginning, but if you're asking a question and the name of the account that you're on is different than the name of your whiskey club membership, just call that out because we're going to base your name off of uh, what it says there. And if we see that you're not part of you know the whiskey club, then we're not going to select you for the prize. So if you're by chance under an account that's not the name associated with your whiskey club membership, um, please make sure you uh, just notate that. But uh, as always, we have the tasting notes here. So we selected nine barrels from 1792. Um, I did have individual tasting notes on each barrel, but we thought it would just be easier to kind of do a cuvee of all of them and um, just did like a blend of a quarter ounce of each of them. And then these were my notes. Um, I guess I was kind of feeling a bit, um, uh, I don't know, esoteric when I was doing these notes. Uh, and so everyone, you know, on the nose here, the specific barrel that I'm tasting this evening is the um, 6427. So as always with our single barrels, it's going to vary slightly um, on the flavor profile. But um, I think these tasting notes, if they, you, as always, we love to see what you guys taste, what you smell. So feel free to chime in in the chat, uh, what you're tasting, what you're smelling. You know, this is 125 proof. Um, if you want to drink this neat, feel free to do so. I usually like to do a little at least a splash of water or um, a single large ice cube um, in anything that's over 100 proof. That's just my personal preference. But if you want to taste something that's 125 proof, neat, feel free to do so. I just find it easier to pick up on flavor profiles. Um, the notes I have here are going to vary slightly on what I'm tasting right now, just because it's this is from a different barrel. Um, but just kind of touching on my notes, so people may be scratching their heads saying, what is Pandan Chiffon Cake? And this is a very esoteric tasting note, but uh, I was playing around with pandan a lot, which is a kind of an Asian um, uh, flavoring that's very similar to vanilla, but not quite as powerful. So it's kind of just a very light, fluffy vanilla cake is a, another way to say it. I guess I was just feeling fancy and wanted to say pandan chiffon cake. So excuse my pretentiousness, um, but uh, I got a lot of like very light, fluffy vanilla cake notes on the nose. Um, this particular barrel that I'm tasting tonight, I was kind of doing a little bit of uh, notes earlier and I got a really strong um, aroma of coconut, which I, I thought was very nice. Um, Danny, I don't know if you want to chime in on any aromas that you have with the, uh, the full proof that you have going on there. Yeah, and, and one comment I want to make too. Um... You know, it is a personal preference, and I, I drink with a lot of bourbon geeks, and they want it out of the barrel, 145 proof. And what I always like to do is on those really strong ones is to ramp it down and do maybe seven variations. Um, you know, 145, 100, and, you know, 20, 110, 100, 190, etc. And and it is actual science that when you dilute it, you change the surface tension, and there's these things called surfactants that now become more volatile and you absolutely can detect more at diluter strengths. Um, no doubt about it. And um, also at the distillery, we taste at 40 proof, which is not the most enjoyable, but you can learn a lot more about the bourbon at very, very low proofs. So when it comes to 
sensor, sensorial evaluation, um, we will do a variety of things. But absolutely, and for me, the sweet spot is about 115. And, um, and that's just a personal preference. Um, but when I taste also, you know, color, you know, color between, again, depending on how it was aged, between a five and 12 year old bourbon, assuming the same proof, we're going to be close to the same. But I will always evaluate aroma, flavor, and finish. That's how I always taste my bourbon. I will sip it 20 times probably for every sip because, you know, by the way, if you sip with your mouth open just a little bit, you force circulation into your olfactory senses and you will pick up more. Um, but I always um, try to look for the primary notes and then I sort of ignore that and go secondary, tertiary, et cetera, to really find out what's going on. And in my bourbon, which is a foolproof, you know, I often get more rye as our primary characteristic, but in this one, I'm getting just a ton of aged concentrated stone fruits. I do get rye as a secondary note. Um, I do get coconut. Coconut, by the way, is a compound called the lactone. And there are two of them. They're sort of mirror images. One's a cis, one's a trans, and I forget which is which. But the other one, which is not as dominant or there, it's not as common in nature, tastes like dill. Uh, but I rarely yeah, get delicious. that. But this one, I get coconut of this one too. And when I get coconut of our bourbons, it doesn't happen all the time, but it speaks to a very special barrel. So I like that component quite a bit. And, um, you know, I my, my taste comments tend to be maybe boring compared to some. Um, Trevor, whatever it was that you got out of yours, I've never used that descriptor in my life. Um, um, but I'm going to have to maybe find a way to sneak it in at some, some point. We had a baker in the comment section. Someone said they were a baker and they they appreciated the uh, the pandan chiffon cake, which is uh, <laughs> which is good. Um, yeah, but flavor profile. You said um, what, what are you what are you picking up on yours? Um, the dominant note. It's kind of a mix between a little bit of rye, and again, I, I, do, I, I value the flavor and also the finish. Uh, the finish has a lot to do with components maybe that are contributing to viscosity. You know, um, some of the oils that are carrying over. Um, you know, that that to me is a big part of the finish. But the flavors that I'm getting on my bourbon are um, a lot of uh, um, a little bit of rye, but also what we call baking spices. You know, some of the um, some of the um, lignans, the, the components in the oak that tend to get spicy, you know, um, clove, trace cinnamon, a um, little bit of woody spice, a um, little bit of sweetness, a little bit of fruit. So I get, um, I, I'm enjoying my foolproof quite a bit. Um, and unfortunately, again, it's not the same when you're tasting, but, you know, and it might be totally different. You know, that's the one thing about single barrels is that there is a lot of barrel to barrel variation. Um, when we create a blend, we're trying to be reasonably consistent, um, but not for the single barrels. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get uh, something that I usually pick up a lot with heavily rye bourbon. Um, I, I do get that dill characteristic sometimes. I'm not picking up a ton on my barrel, but um, flavor profile wise, I, I get a ton of like cacao or, or very dark, bitter chocolate um, sometimes with rye. And I, I picked up that a lot on, on my specific barrel, but. I definitely agree with your baking spices uh here i have like a cinnamon raisin um was a, a note that i that i picked up and then um finish wise i mean obviously 125 proof we're going to be pretty long and lingering here and i just had kind of a note of kind of like dusty oak um towards the end uh, on my finish um that's how it kind of um rounded out for me mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, one thing that also is interesting that I didn't talk about, our distillery, the equipment, some of it is very old. I've got fermenters that were built in 1944, uh, which are copper bearing carbon steel. And, um, and then I've got some fermenters that were built in 69, and the still comes from the early 60s, and then it was modified in the 90s. And there is a, um, if I may say so, a terroir associated with the equipment. Um, you know, we um, have yeast growing, but we also have bacteria that exist in our facility. And um, we try to keep them, and it's kind of hard to know for sure, but we do monitor a certain amount of acid production 
and we are trying to keep that asset growth in a tight range and it provides a lot of complexity to our bourbon you know if anyone makes sourdough bread you know those bacteria that make that sour are incredibly flavorful and important and that's a big part of our process but anyways there is a terroir that's associated with our equipment i have no doubts about that our still is unique if somebody took our grain bill and our yeast and tried to make our bourbon in their still i do not believe they would be successful it's it's um a lot of specific equipment that is unique to us so um it's it's just something that i don't think anyone else can do nor could we probably make their bourbon in our stills for the same reasons uh really quick i'm gonna uh grab some pay shots bitters i'm gonna make a cocktail here really quick but as i make it um you know i'm not gonna go through it but i'd love to hear just kind of um your take on being named as uh, uh jim murray's 2020 whiskey of the year kind of what that meant to you and um yeah. how that came about and kind of what uh what that meant to 1792, both uh, in the moment and kind of what it led to. Well, I'll tell you, it was um, it was we're a very humble group, uh, but it was very um, satisfying. Um, Jim Murray is regarded as an outstanding whiskey taster, and he has been tasting whiskey for I believe decades. Now we do not send him a specific bourbon, as far as I know. He goes out and buys it and pulls it off the shelf. And to be whiskey of the world is, is really quite, there, there's a couple things that are really noteworthy. That award is special, but also, again, Jim Murray is a well-regarded, respected taster, and his opinion is valued. So he's not saying that we were the best bourbon. He certainly said we are the best bourbon, but as a category, we, um, we, have, we, we made a better bourbon than he felt. Um, certain scotches were in the scotch category. You know, obviously you can't compare a bourbon to a scotch with any, you know, especially, you know, depending on what kind of scotch. But he felt that we were special and outstanding and represented the style better than any other whiskey in any other category. So, yes, it was special. And um, I think as a group, we were very proud of that. So, you know, that's, I guess, how I would sum it up. Yeah, I would agree with Danny as well. I think that it was, um, you know, 1792, is, like Danny said, we were pretty humble. We have been winning awards from the big awards shows for quite some time now, but having somebody name us World Whiskey of the Year, and I know he tastes 4,000 plus whiskeys every single year and rates them and um, each and every year. So having our be named the best out of 4,000 different whiskeys was quite a feat and really helped put um, – some more credibility behind our brand and, and really helped to bring some more attention to it before we kind of flew under the radar as um, a little bit underrated. And, and now I think we're getting some more attention that's, that's well-deserved, but also um, we're just really happy to have been given that award. And the problem with that though is, is that even our small batch I think is allocated. It, it, yeah. I'm seeing it around Kentucky where they're limiting our small batch to one bottle per person in some areas. So um, the good news is that it's notoriety. The bad news is, you know, it takes, you know, seven to 12 plus years to make bourbon. So we cannot just turn a switch and get more out uh, before it is time. A little absinthe, I assume. Yes. Yeah, so I'm doing a Sazerac here. So I'm, I'm, if we have any cocktail purists on the call, they may be um, rolling their eyes at me because, uh, I'm using a bourbon in a Sazerac, but I felt the high ride characteristic was uh, was fitting um, for this. I'm failing to find my strainer here, so I'm going to improvise. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not. Um, I haven't been looking at questions. Are there any questions, Chris? That you? Yeah, I'm going to get to it right now. No, sorry about that. Yeah, there's a ton of questions, Danny, and I know that there's going to be some Q and A at the end, but. Um, while he's yep. making that cocktail, maybe it'd be a good one to, to jump in, was Matt Vargo asked, since whiskey is your day job, what do you like to drink when you get home or you're relaxing? Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are many ways to express that. You know, I, I've i got an adequate bar at home and, and I'll have a, a drink or a cocktail at home. I love and appreciate well-made cocktails. Um, old fashions, there are an infinite way, number of ways to make an old fashioned. 
you know, what bitters you use. My cocktails are always spirit forward. And, um, you know, I'll mix up the bitters. You know, sometimes I'll, I will never muddle fruit. But one thing I've learned is that if you take an ice cube, soak it in bitters and a peel, just the peel and muddle the peel with the sugar, you know, you get a different explosion of citrus. So I, I really like experimenting with cocktails, be it a Manhattan, be it a, an old fashioned, you know, whiskey sours. I prefer very, very, very low rye bourbons. Um, you know, so I like I like experimenting with cocktails and I think there's an art to it. I think that um, the sounds of it, I only use big ice, you know, either one inch cubes or two inch cubes. I, I think the ice is really important. The sound of it, um, the dilution, you know, you don't want too much dilution. Um, the type of glassware you use, I, I think it's an incredible craft and I, I like cocktails, but I, I will drink a bourbon often, sometimes a rye, you know, it's sort of, you know, I go home and I look and I, you know, look at my bar and I, I decide which one speaks to me at the moment. So um, it, it's usually sort of a spur of the moment decision. All right. Yeah. So let's just kind of dive into these. Um, so Chris, I miss, who is that one that you asked? Do you remember that was Matt Vargo. Matt Vargo. Awesome. Um, cool. So I get Renee uh, Quint Quintanilla asks, uh, Danny, what is the, uh, what's your favorite liquor that you have developed? Well, you know, when we talk about developing liquors, you know, there's a couple ways to look at that. Um, it's what I've distilled and aged, but it's also, you know, my role as master, um, master distiller, but there's also a title called master blender, which speaks to the art of what we do and how do you take various barrels to create something special. And um, although this will be a little bit unfair to the audience, we, re we, sent, we recently released a um, bourbon for our employees only to purchase. And it was a four barrel blend of 12 year old bourbons. And it was just freaking magical. Um, and there was some specialness about it. And we had many barrels to choose from, and I ended up picking this blend, but they were barrels that were stored up high in our Rick house for probably eight and a half years. And then they were, sort, they were literally lost. We brought them down to a, a cold, damp warehouse to be sampled and, and for someone to single barrel select, but they got lost on inventory. We literally found them four and a half, five years later. So we had some 12, 13, 14 year old bourbons and they actually picked up the aroma of that particular warehouse. They got this earthy, um, musty, um, very unique. You know, the bourbon smelt like um, the warehouse smells and it tasted just incredible. So that was one. But then also along those lines, we've got the Thomas S. Moore lineup now, which are bourbons, our, our, our high rye mash bill bourbon that were aged in secondary casks. So we had a Chardonnay. Um, the first go around in a port and a Cabernet and that Cabernet, for example, makes an incredible, perfect Manhattan, you know, with a split of dry and sweet vermouth. It was really incredible. Um, we've got another round of those coming out, a sherry cask, um, a cognac, a Madeira and a Merlot. And I think that, um, some of those were special. I think that the other one, I think the Chardonnay was unique. That was a six to seven year old bourbon that was stored in a secondary cask for an additional five years. So it, it, blending that was special because there were some barrels that were not as good and some that were really good. And sometimes you mix two that are pretty good, you get one that's way better. So trying to figure that out was a challenge. And that was one that I, um, I think is one of my favorite liquors that I've developed. Awesome. And that was distillery release only, right? That's never. Well, the, the 12 year old one was, there were 550 bottles ish. The Thomas S. Moore is available across the nation as far as i know yeah. uh this is a good question from nick nick ricci um i guess for both of you guys uh chris i guess i'll direct it to you first what has been your most memorable whiskey moment uh working in the whiskey that the whiskey industry has afforded you um or what has been the most memorable pour you have shared with someone i think i can answer both these in one swing so being with the company for two and a half years, one of the first projects that I started to work on was the Thomas S. Moore brand. Taking that from what was an experiment that Danny and I both inherited of a lot of different types of finishing cask bourbons and making that into a brand, everything from designing the packaging to the marketing materials, crafting the brand story um, has been a really cool opportunity just from a marketing perspective to launch a new brand. 
and really see that be successful in the market, um, winning some awards, getting some really nice reviews. And so that's been great. And the most memorable four I've shared with someone probably because it's most recent, most top of mind was sharing that the three Thomas S. Moore bourbons last Christmas with my grandfather, um, who was who got me into bourbon to begin with. So that was pretty special to share that brand that I helped launch with uh, somebody I cared a lot about. The most special one that I poured, um, it was actually when I first moved to Kentucky, I was dealing with um, some retailers and I was able to taste a Kentucky gentleman that was distilled in 1917. And it was um, um, bottled in um, right after Prohibition, 1933. So it had sat aging uh, for that long of a period of time. And again, it was it was over 100 years old since it was distilled. You know, I tasted it and I guess that was 2018, but it was um, it was made in 1917. So that was um, that was special. Sorry. What was the first part of that question? Uh, what's what's been your most memorable whiskey moment that working in the industry has afforded you? OK, so that was clearly an industry wide event, but also with our master blender for Sazerac, Drew Mayville, I was able to taste um, some really special last drop products um, that are just incredibly unique. I mean, a hundred year old port, 50 years in a barrel, 50 years in a bottle and then a 50 year old scotch, for example. Those were special and those kind of things are rare. So that was um, that was a special event. Also, you know, tasting with some like uh, master distillers and just sitting around talking um, shop and, you know, um, how flavors are created and, you know, just we're sort of unbalanced. We talk a lot about bourbon when we're not making bourbon as well. So that's pretty cool. It's an interesting question from Jason Chen. Uh, could you please share your experience when one of the Rick houses collapsed in 2018? particularly interested in the scent of the scene. Yeah, not much to say there. That was a long time ago. Um, um, it smelled like brandy because it was the brandy barrels that broke and the vast majority of that was collected. Um, I mean, the vast majority of it was um, was not um, damaged, you know, so, you know, yeah, it, it smelled like brandy. Um, this is kind of a bias question but since we we found out that you uh, grew up in southern california uh how did growing up in the san fernando valley valley influence or this is danielle klein how did growing up in san fernando valley uh influence your history or lead you to working in a distillery yeah sure that's actually um, a really interesting question uh, but I, you know i actually grew up in santa monica so technically not the san fernando valley however the first um i had a lot of family in the san fernando valley so i spent a lot of time there so it's a fair question um, I actually, the first brewery I worked at was the Van Nuys um, um, uh, Manheiser Bush Brewery. But my first experience, and I think this is important, when I was uh, probably five years old, my mom and one of her good friends apparently were day drinkers, and they used to go to Bush Garden. <laughs> and, um, and I remember this, but they went to Bush Gardens and they were sitting there. It was a free bird garden and a free bird show, and they were just sitting around talking. And whenever she wasn't looking, I would take a sip of her beer. And um, and even back way back then, one of the employees came down on her hard. And I remember this saying, lady, if you continue to let your son drink beer, we are going to have to ask you to leave. Um, so she was embarrassed by that. But I remember, you know, I wasn't slamming beer, but I remember the bubbles and the bitterness. And it was intriguing. And also, I played baseball at a little league field in the San Fernando Valley called WBBA. And right behind the field was... Um, the Schlitz Brewery that then became the Stroh's Brewery. And we used to sneak under the fence and um, explore um, the, the distillery where they had junk stored and old barrels and all the smells. And, um, you know, and also I lived, um, we used to pass the Van Nuys Brewery all the time. And there was a Keebler um, cookie factory, which smelled buttery and savory. I always hated that smell. But when you drove by the brewery, um, everyone hated that smell and I loved it. And I later learned that at certain times I'd smell hops boiling. Sometimes I'd smell um, unhopped wort boiling. And then I'd smell the bottle shop. So I learned later what all those different smells were that I loved growing up. So I, I think that's actually an interesting, relevant question because um, I remember that very much at a young, as a young person. By the way, nobody in high school ever says, how about a career in the beer industry? Um, so, <laughs> Your counselor so, didn't uh... 
didn't steer you in that direction. Absolutely not, especially not me, because I got in a little bit of trouble around that area. But I enjoy alcohol a lot, and I think education has gotten a lot better. And I, I look at my kids, they're so much smarter than I was. There's a better sense of responsibility. And, you know, we have a beautiful, wonderful industry, but there are some problems that we have to be associated with. So even though I talk about these things in a large hearted way, you know, it's super critical to be responsible. And, and um, you know, and, you know, when I grew up, when I grew up, I, I think we were not as smart as kids are today. So that's something I appreciate. But yeah, San Fernando Valley and 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 my area of, of hanging out actually was a huge factor for sure. Uh, Chris, this isn't a question, but I guess I'll ask you kind of the same thing. You grew up in Kentucky. I'm sure you, that was much more of an influence on you to uh, lead you into uh, the career you are at now uh, than growing up in the San Fernando Valley. Absolutely. Like Danny, uh, if you're familiar with Frankfort, Kentucky, Buffalo Trace sits down in a valley as well. And growing up in Frankfort, I often smelled the uh, the distillery. And as a young, you know, growing up, I hated that smell and then came to love it as I grew older. And now the smell just reminds me of home. Uh, I, now I live near a, a Jif peanut butter factory. So I smell the peanut butter uh, being made, which also smells really good. But I, I still love the uh, the smell of the distillery and obviously growing up around it and knowing people that work there and having family that, you know, they grew up drinking bourbon and shared the love of bourbon with me. Um, was really nice to get to continue on with that and in, in a professional way. I still really enjoy uh, bourbon outside of work, though, sharing it with friends and family. Awesome. By the way, my dad was born and raised in Kentucky, so I um, I have roots, I suppose, or seeds. I don't know. We, we weren't doubting your cred, Danny, I promise. <laughs> um, Matthew Tupper, hey, this is a good question. He says, uh, uh, do you guys have a favorite 1792 product and or any barrels that maybe still surprise you? Um, also, kind of a second question, which is a, more of a geeky question, in my opinion. He said, uh, the first the first four barrels, um, do, you, do you ever pull those uh, and blend them with anything that's maybe a higher age statement to uh, bring down some of the uh, oaky characteristics to kind of balance them out? Well, um, first of all, the favorite expression, that's a tough one. I, I, I think that of our package ones, I do prefer the 12 year old, um, I, but I also like foolproof a lot. Um, we've had some incredibly special barrels. You know, every once in a while, we'll find some that are really, truly amazing. And, um, you know, it's not a particular warehouse. It's not a particular floor. There's, there's, um, there's maybe some anecdotal conclusions, but you know, it's not clear. And, and to put it in perspective, the honey barrels, you know, the, the really special barrels, I love that term honey barrel, you know, just put it in perspective, there may be 20 of those a year. And they're, they're ones that stand out as being truly spectacular. So there's, there are those and there are a handful of those that stand out as being really special. Uh, but in terms of how we blend, you know, there's a certain profile we're looking for in foolproof and on small batch and on, um, um, bottled and bond. So we, you know, look at those blends ahead of time and we will um, look at those, you know, blend in order to hit those target profiles. So, you know, bottled and bond um, tends to have a little bit more of a grain character, just subtly so. So it comes from maybe slightly lower houses. Full proof tends to be a little bit higher relative to our bourbon. So we're looking for profiles and if we're too far out of whack, we'll blend to get it back into profile. So that's that's that blending is certainly a big part of how we get to our final final bottlings. Got it. A couple more questions here. I know we're just over an hour, or so um, Phil Schwen wants to know: Is that a fedora? Well, Phil, I guess you'll have to ask me next time I see you in person. Sorry, that's a friend of mine that's uh, trolling me here. Um, but uh, Gary Malberg wants to know, uh, are the grains you use locally sourced? Uh, and do you find better flavors from specific areas in where you source your grains? Yeah, so our corn, about 90% of it probably comes from a 30 mile diameter. So it's a very tight radius. Um, rye does not grow well in Kentucky, which is probably how we ended up making bourbon. Our forefathers came over, I think, making rye whiskey and rye grows well in the Northeast and in the upper 
you know, Canadian plains where it's cold and harsh. Um, so we don't grow rye locally. It comes from further away. But the corn uh, being local, being fresh, um, having relationships with our growers is important. And it's, um, it's a dominant and important flavor of our, of our whiskey for sure. Our malted barley typically comes from you know, Minnesota and the Dakotas. And, you know, it's a, it's a relatively small percentage in our grain bill. And that's important because the enzymes that come from malted barley are what help break down the starch into um, sugar. So, so that's important, but, but the, the corn, the vast majority of our grain is from a very local region. Awesome. All right, gentlemen, we're just about at an hour five, uh, uh, and a lot of great information this evening. Uh, we do have to get down to business and choose a couple winners here. So I'm just going to quickly run through all the questions from the Q and a that we asked. And, uh, I know there was a ton of questions. Sorry, we didn't get to everybody. Um, but just need each of you to choose your favorite so we had renee uh, which was uh what was the favorite liquor you developed we had uh danielle that asked the question about kind of where you grew up and what uh led you to working in distilling uh we had matt vargo ask uh what whiskey you like to drink at home when you're relaxing jason chen asked um about the rick housing collapsing and what the smell was like uh let's see nick ricci asked memorable moment about working in the whiskey industry has afforded you and a memorable pour you've shared with somebody uh matthew tupper asked uh what barrels still surprise you uh and then how your blending process how you you take first floor barrels and blend them with other uh higher age statements um and then gary malberg asked uh, the question about the grains being locally sourced. So those were our questions this evening. Um, I'll let uh, Chris, you want to choose your favorite and then I'll let Danny close us out. Sure. I think I'm going to go with uh, Nick Ricci's about the most memorable whiskey moment. That really spoke to me just because I think bourbon's a lot about family and friends and community and sharing with other people. So I like that one. Cool. Congrats, Nick. Uh, we will be reaching out to you and getting your information to send you a cool 1792 swag bag with uh, some rad stuff and uh, signed bottle. Uh, and then Danny. Uh, yeah, I'm because sure it was. You can steal your, uh, your, your, your one, but. Sure, because it was, um, you know, personal and brought back fond memories. I like Danielle's, Danielle Klein's question about um, the influence of San Fernando Valley. And there, there are a lot of really powerful influences in, in terms of going by breweries and smelling the smells and, and it was a fond memory as a kid and and um you know and one more i'll add to that actually back in santa monica my grandmother who was a very petite woman um would drink little tiny eight ounce olympia beers and um and i would go over there and god this is horrible but i'll, I'll share it anyways um as a middle <laughs> schooler i would drink a i'd go steal one of her little miller excuse me one of her little olympias and and, and go hide somewhere and drink it um, and I, I love the taste of beer. And, and I think I enjoy it so much, I actually do uh, drink responsibly because that's important. But anyways, I love the question because there were a lot of influences when I was younger. And um, that kind of got me to where I am, I think. So I have one last question. I apologize just because um, you grew up in the beer industry and beer is very fond to me. Favorite Sierra Nevada beer of all time? So that would have to be Celebration Ale. Oh, and, you and me both. And, and I'll share with you why. So when I, a um, couple, couple of stories once. Um, I, um, um, not that long ago, but a, about a year before I started working for Sierra Nevada, I broke my leg very badly in a mountain bike crash. And on the way home from the hospital, when we're picking up our meds at the pharmacist, I saw that they had celebration. I told my wife, you have to get a case. And she said, no. And I says, well, either you're going to get me a case or I'm going to hobble in there and get a case. So, come on. <laughs> so anyway, she bought it, but then she hid it from me. So that was the story. However, the more important story is that when I went to Sierra Nevada, um, what that's a very simple beer, caramel malt and pale malt. However, um, the, the caramel malt we use was super special. But more important was the Centennial Hop. They're picked and they're brought to the brewery. We brew with it right away. However, those hops have an extremely short harvest window. 
And we found that, you know, if you pick them too early, they're a little unripe and they lack aroma. If you wait too late, they get a little ripe and they get a little onion garlicky. Maybe not so much with Centennial hops, but the short window. So I put somebody on the ground to pick hops uh, when they were ripe and they made decisions in the field. And that really made the beer pop and explode um, with, um, with, with intensity. Unfortunately, they're not doing that anymore, I hear. But, but that was, um, that was uh, something special about that beer. That's awesome. Well, Ken, Ken Grossman's on my uh, brewing uh, Mount Rushmore. So uh, yeah, all right. And probably also one more hazy little thing, because that was the last contribution I made before I left. That was uh, that was my team's beer. Nice. Well, uh, Chris, Danny, can't thank you enough for um, joining us this evening and sharing such great insight about 1792. I, I appreciate it. I know our members appreciate it. And um, you know, just can't thank you enough. So uh, cheers. And I wish you guys the uh, to have a great evening. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And um, it's been good talking to you all. Yeah, thank you all. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. See you. Bye-bye.